What spawns these videos? Uh, a father posted this video of his 11-year-old son who is pretending to be a girl who goes by Edie and she's preparing for her first date. Uh, he is 11. 11 year old boy pretending to be a girl going on his his first date and dad proudly films this for social media consumption. My daughter Edie and today is a big day because she's going on her first date. This is what I'm going to wear. So the guy I'm meeting is a big fan of Stranger Things. So I got him some gifts. So first I got Jonathan, then I got Mac, then I got Henry, and I also got Dustin. Oh, and if the date doesn't work out, I'm keeping them. I also got him this iPad so he can FaceTime me. I'll also be keeping this if the date doesn't go well. Okay, now I'm all ready to go on the date and I'll update you guys how it went. This is an update. There's so much wrong with that. Oh. It's difficult to know where to begin. Right. And it, it, it includes the, uh, the, the gender identity portion, but a lot of it has to do with social media and whatever is going on in that house. Anyway, um, another such example of this, the, answering the question, where do these, what spawns these videos? Yeah, this is grotesque. Um, a middle school gay straight alliance group, middle school, the uh, senior leadership of the Middle School Gay Straight Alliance introduces themselves, again, for social media consumption, in full rainbow regalia. Hello, my name is Ace. I also go by Spade and Alex. A lot of people call me Marshmallow. I use any pronouns except for she, her, and I am the social media secretary of the Celine Middle School Gay Straight Alliance Club. This will be our first video, so we are doing a brief introduction of the membership. But other than that, have a good time here. Hi, I'm Jinx. I go by they at pronouns, and I am the vice president of GSA, and I am Cal's father. Hi, my name is B. Um, pronouns they, them, and um, I'm GSA secretary. One little fact about myself is that I like speaking. Hello, my name is Asher Rohan, depending on where you know me from. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the club treasurer. Uh, fact about me is that I'm an artist. I like to draw digitally, and yeah, that's it. Um, I'm Sox. I am the eighth grade representative to GSA. I use uh, she, they pronouns, and um, one interesting fact about me is that I was one of three cuttable characters in the play. Hi, my name is Clover. Um, my my pronouns change often, but if you just if you don't know, just say they them. Um, one interest. Oh, I'm the sixth grade representative, and one uh, fact about me is I love manga. The president did not want to be in this video, but their name is Cal, and they have purple and black hair. If you want to. Yeah, that means that means. Bye. That's um. Uh, very interesting incidents of uh, grade schoolers identifying as on the LGBTQIA2S++ spectrum, isn't it? Yeah, but I want to go back to Edie real quick. I, I know we have a guest, but she's a 11-year-old. Who, who goes on a date at 11 years old? And the, the video that the dad, what makes it even what grotesque to me is she's got, like, this is a pedophile he, dr he. dream. Or he, whatever. He, uh, he has her in a half shirt and a short skirt. Shame on him. He has him in a half he has, shirt. What, it, it's gross. Uh huh. He should be in jail for that. That is a, encouraging bad behavior, and I, I, I'm appalled. Uh, our friend Theodore Dalrymple writing over at City Journal in a piece entitled "What Are We Doing to Children?" Oh, well, That's a good apropos. question. <laughs> and um, wait, so what spawns these videos? These videos. Clicks. I don't know what. This one has 1.2 million dollar million views so far. What spawns them is, what spawns videos like you just heard is videos like you just heard. That's uh, my contention. Let's get an expert's contention. Uh, he is Theodore Dalrymple, contributing editor to the aforesaid City Journal, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, the author of many wonderful books. If you're not familiar with Theodore Dalrymple's oeuvre, you should get familiar. 
His latest is entitled On the Ivory Stages, published by Marabou Press. On the Ivory Stages is Theodore Dalrymple's latest book. Theodore Dalrymple, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for asking me. So um, this uh, the suddenness with which an infrequent diagnosis becomes first common and then the object of an entire ideology and social cause is astonishing. Well, you're describing what's happened with uh, gender identity. So how? How does it happen? What, you know, what is the, um, the, the basis of videos like we just played? Well, I, I can't claim to have the complete answer. Um, I think uh, it's a compound of many things. Apart from anything else, it's uh, self-dramatization, uh, narcissism, the ability to show off the desire to individuate yourself without uh, having any individuality. And uh, this seems to have increased enormously, uh, possibly uh, as a result of a decline in uh, any form of re a religious belief. I don't know, ultimately. Uh, but at any rate, it's, um, it's a form of uh, narcissism and self-dramatization. Uh, self um, and it's been encouraged by... Uh, dare I say it, an entire industry. Well, and the entire industry being the medical profession? Yes, and social workers and the, care, the so-called caring professions. Well, right, and, and we, we talked about this report that came out last week, uh, the Do No Harm, which is a nonprofit that opposes um, this uh, sort of gender ideology informing medical decisions. Um, the uh, And they've got a list of the hospitals that do uh, gender transition surgeries and prescribed puberty blockers for kids and all this stuff. It's all, they're focused on kids specifically, of course, yeah. right, that don't have agency and, and legal standing. Um, uh, so, uh, they, I mean, it's, it's it, you know, this is still in its infancy, but it's in the tens of millions of dollars in terms of the money generated for these procedures and those prescriptions. And so in addition to pr an ideological component, there's a financial one. Uh, yes, yes. Well, they, they often go together. But I, I mean, if you just think about uh, uh, um, the prescription of um, uh, puberty blockers uh, to obviously pre-pubertal uh, children, uh, the effects, the long-term effects aren't known. And in fact, you can you can't do proper research on it because it's unethical to do it. I mean, if you if you start uh, experimenting on children for a non-fatal condition whose natural history, anyway, is con completely unknown, um, you're entering uh, Dr. Mengele country. This is this is like Dr. Mengele conducting experiments. So, in other words. It is completely unethical to do any research, in my view, that is, any research on puberty blockers. Well, is that, and, and ultimately, wasn't that the conclusion that um, uh, British authorities reached when they shut down the Tavistack Not, clinic? Not quite as strong as that, as they should have been. They, they said, until more research is done, but that research should never be done. Right. Because... You can't ask children for their consent because they, by almost by definition, they don't understand what they're consenting to. And so you're experimenting on young children without any idea, really, of what the consequences of doing so are. And while this might be, might once have been all right for a disease such as leukemia, which is now fortunately um, treatable, uh, this is not this situation is not at all comparable so what i would say is that uh, the people who are doing this are not merely mistaken but criminal mm. and so why i mean is that why british authorities are tiptoeing back from the precipice here even if they're using sort of weaselly language to do so is because they realize there there isn't the evidentiary support and 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 frankly um, perhaps there's a lot more uh, legal and moral exposure than they're comfortable with? Ah, yes. I mean, I think uh, what might bring it all to an end is, is the, the, the legal con I mean, it shouldn't be legal consequences that bring it to an end. It should be reflection on the, the morality of the whole situation. 
but at some stage uh, there are going to be huge uh, legal actions. In fact, there's already one legal action in Britain, a class action against the Tavistock Clinic. Uh, and this, w um, because we have a socialized uh, medical uh, system, the people who are going to pay, of course, are, uh, are the taxpayers. But nevertheless, uh, there's going to be a huge uh, legal liability uh, in the near future. Well, it's so interesting in Britain because, I mean, Britain is going to get so far the other way in so many respects, as, as is America, but Britain even faster. I mean, I saw a court ruling this week that um, calling um, a bald man bald is a, a form of sexual harassment, just as it would be as commenting on women's, a woman's physical features, and this is actionable. Um, in addition to people in, in in Britain being routinely, you know, visited by police for uh, social media posts that uh, question you know, the COVID vaccine or question any particular policy where the, the debate, they say, is over. So it's just interesting that this, where there's so much zeitgeist behind this gender identity business, Britain is going the other way. Yes, well, I'm very, I'm very glad. I wish it were going the other way in other respects, too. Um, but there is a um, reaction against this also. The British Medical Association, of which I cannot speak lowly enough, um, <laughs> um, uh, tried to, well, suggested that, 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 the, that the BMA should not accept the CAS uh, report. Uh, and, of course, the BMA has no standing in the matter, actually. It hasn't the ability to enforce anything upon doctors. But nevertheless, it goes to show uh, what, um, what terrible people we have in control of the largest medical association in the country. I, was, oh. well, I, 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 I just want to go to something that you uh, included in this piece you wrote for City Journal, uh, What Are We Doing to Children?, it was interesting. You, you went back to your time as a prison psychiatrist and how you and your colleagues dealt with uh, male inmates who identified as transsexual. Um, and and you, you, I, I like the way you described it, too, so sort of d describing how, the approach you took, you know, in an era when these sorts of diagnoses were, were pre-ideological in terms of a determination of what to do. So, I mean, just uh, when these, you know, nothing is new. So when, when uh, this occurred pre-ideological uh, orthodoxy on the topic coming from the left and the institutions it controls in the West, what did you do? What did you and your colleagues do in those situations? Well, in, in practice, what happened was that uh, a male transsexual, I mean, I get terribly muddled up whether a male transsexual is a male yeah, right. going to male or a female going to male. I always get it muddled up. But anyway, the males who were going to females were actually uh, kept in, in, um, in male prisons. And they... Uh, like sex offenders, they were put in, in, into conditions of, of, of special um, protection so that they didn't uh, mix with most of the uh, other prisoners who would almost certainly have um, been physically abusive to them. Uh, and so uh, they, united, they were united with the sex offenders who were um, uh, protected from... Uh, the uh, activities of the rest of the uh, of the prisoners, uh, but they were very few, of course. I mean, we one of the most remarkable things about this is the astonishing increase in prevalence in 2013. I think DSM uh, five was published. It gave uh, the prevalence uh, of gender dysphoria as naught point naught naught. I think it was naught naught one three percent of the population. That was sort of one in, uh, what's that, one in, uh, one in 100,000. And uh, in 2000, and, I think it was 2017, there was an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, which suggested that 0.6, that is um, uh, six in a thousand um, uh, people in America have gender dysphoria. Well, that's a seventy percent, a seven thousand percent increase in a matter of four years, and the New England Journal of Medicine did not even notice it, let alone comment on it, or even think, how can this be so? 
What is the explanation of this increase? Is it uh, an unrecognized, is it that it was unrecognized before, or is it something else? My own view is that it's um, a form of uh, social hysteria and uh, narcissism. But, but anyway, even if my explanation is incorrect, uh, you would have thought that it was a question that would arise in people's minds, but not at all. Well, isn't it in rising in popularity because it's a big business? I mean, it's going to be a billion-dollar business soon. It's a way yes, to make money. Also, yeah, there's big money, but there's also the individual people who are, who are, I think, probably seeking, um, seeking to dramatize their own lives, or in some cases, it's, um, it's uh, child abuse by proxy. I mean, it's parents act actively encouraging their children uh, to uh, change sex or, or to claim that they are, uh, of course, at their age, I didn't even know what sex was, but still, uh, that uh, uh, there's, a, so there's more than one, the more than one thing going into this terrible, this horrible, um, muddy river. Theodore Dalrupple is contributing editor to City Journal, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and author of many books, including his latest, On the Ivory Stages. On the Ivory Stages, Theodore Dal Dalrupple's latest book. Theodore Dalrupple, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, and he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's news, opinion, insight. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Hi, I'm Ken Mariotti, owner of Woodland Windows and Doors, a third-generation family-owned business since 1969. We know you're bombarded by choices when shopping for new windows or doors, so we're inviting you to experience the Woodland difference. For decades, we have been transforming living spaces with Marvin Windows, a fifth-generation family business. Marvin replacement windows have been known to increase the warmth of your cold rooms by 10 degrees. Think about that, 10 degrees warmer. When you welcome Woodland into your home, you will get a product expert to transform your living spaces, full-time dedicated professional installers that you can trust in your home, along with the best products like Marvin. These are the reasons we're proud of our five-star reviews and family legacy. No gimmicks, no pressure, and upfront pricing are why Woodland Windows and Doors is your trusted